GPU instancing and static batching are both optimization techniques in Unity that can improve your game's performance by reducing the number of draw calls being made. Today we're going to dive into both of them so the differences are easy to understand and implement. Before we can do that, we need to know a little bit about how the scriptable render pipeline batcher works, and then we'll get right into the what, why, and how of GPU instancing and static batching in Unity 6. Let's get into it. In this project, I'm using the universal render pipeline. The first thing we want to take a look at is the scriptable render pipeline batcher. Normally in a URP project, this is on by default, but it's not immediately obvious how to toggle it on or off. If we come into project settings under graphics, you can click your render pipeline asset that will ping it in your project window and then you can see it in the inspector. The checkbox for the SRP batcher should show up here in the rendering section, but if it's not here, go into preferences under graphics. There's a drop down list here where you can set the advanced properties to be all visible. Now, if we take a look in the inspector, you can see we've got the checkbox exposed for the SRP batcher and a few other things such as dynamic batching. For now, just make sure that the SRP batcher is toggled on. We'll probably come back to this render pipeline asset later, so I'm going to drag it into my favorites window. The SRP batcher reduces the CPU time needed to render scenes with many materials that use the same shader variant. Let's take a look at an example. In this scene here, I've got a ground plane that's using a black material. The black material is made with the URP lit shader. I also have a cube in this scene that just has the default lit shader on it, but this is the exact same shader variant, only the material is different. I've already opened up the frame debugger, which you can find under window analysis, and I'm just gonna hit play. Now, as soon as I hit enable in the frame debugger, it's gonna pause the game and show me exactly what's going on with the rendering pipeline. What's most useful for us right now, we can find under the draw opaque objects section. Now, I'm just gonna drag this out because it's a little bit hard to see, and let's zoom in a little bit. Here we can see some useful information about what's going on. One of the most useful bits of information in here is the batch cause. Why did it decide to batch these particular items together? And right below that, you can see the meshes that were included. We have our plane and we have our cube. It was able to batch the rendering of those two objects together because they use the same shader variant. So let's dock this frame debugger again for a minute and see what happens when we include a game object that uses a different shader variant, or in this case, a completely different shader. If I come out of play mode and disable the frame debugger, I'm going to enable this sphere. You can see already that it's using an unlit shader just from looking at it in the game window. But let's select the material. I named it unlit red and it's using the universal render pipelines unlit shader. I think we know what's going to happen. Let's enable the frame debugger again. You don't have to be in play mode to enable the frame debugger. The objects are already being rendered. If we open up the draw opaque objects section again, we can see there are now two batches. Let's pull this tab out again and take a closer look. I'll select the first batch here and we can see it looks exactly the same as before. It has the plane and the cube. You can also see just above it says there are two draw calls in this batch. If I select the second batch, now we can see it has the sphere mesh and the cause of creating a separate batch is because the node has a different shader. You can also see here that there was only one draw call in this batch. When you see low draw call numbers like these in batches, it often means that your project uses too many different shaders or shader variants. Now, the URP batcher is fundamental to optimizing the rendering of your Unity project. So getting a handle on the number of shaders and shader variants used in your project can make a huge difference in not just build time, but also has a big impact on your frame rate. So just to recap this, the SRP batcher reduces the CPU time Unity requires to prepare and dispatch draw calls for materials that use the same shader variant. To optimize this, use fewer shader variants with a minimal amount of keywords to improve the batching. When we talk about keywords, we're talking about all the extra features that would lead you to have multiple variants. Things like having glow enabled or an outline. You know, even if you only had the three that are listed here on the screen, that would result in eight variations because you would have combinations of one or two or all three or maybe none. I'm going to quickly mention a tool that I use because it's on sale right now until March 25th, and that is Shader Control. This tool will list all the shaders and materials in your project, show you the keywords and the shader variant count. It'll let you toggle any keywords in a shader with one click, and it will update the shader for you. You don't have to do any shader programming. Highly recommended optimization tool. I'll leave a link in the description. 
So you should have the SRP batcher running in any URP or HDRP project that you're making, but let's move on to look at another technique. Static batching is an optimization technique where the engine is going to try to take all of your models that have the same material and combine them into one huge mesh. It's usually enabled by default, and you can find that setting in project settings under player in other settings. I've added a whole bunch of objects into my scene here that all have different meshes, but they all share the same material. I haven't marked any of them as static yet. Let's hit play and see what it looks like in the frame debugger. If we take a look here, we can see it's still batching everything into one operation, but that operation is making 11 different draw calls, one for each object in the scene. The frame debugger has a nice feature. If you scroll down here, you can see each of the individual meshes that's being used in any given batch. I've got the basic cube, I've got a few different kinds of rocks, my sphere, my plane. Now, supposing these are just environment objects in my scene, what would be ideal in many cases is to actually group those all together into as few draw calls as possible. To get started with this, select all the objects that aren't going to move, or select their parent, and make sure they're marked as batching static. Or you can just click the static field and mark them as static everything. Now let's see what happens when we click play and go back into the frame debugger. We can see right away that the SRP batcher still put everything into one batch, but we now only have six draw calls. Down in the meshes section, you can see that the engine took several of our objects and combined them together and it left a few separate. At the top, you can see we have a combined mesh. If we scroll down here, you can see all of the objects that were combined together into a bigger mesh. And then for whatever reason, the optimization engine decided to leave two of them out. The batching is a little bit of a black box, but there are many reasons why I would choose to combine some and not others. The main one being they all share the same material, but there are other factors such as maximum vertex count. It's worth pointing out that static batching requires extra CPU memory. That's because under the hood, Unity creates a copy of the mesh for each game object and inserts each copy into the combined mesh. This means that the same geometry appears in the combined mesh multiple times. This is also why you don't want to use static batching for things like trees and grass in your game, because doing this for every single tree is going to have a massive impact on your memory use. So when should you choose to use static batching? It works for static objects, but not moving objects. It reduces your draw calls, but it's not going to save you any memory. In fact, it's going to cost you memory, but it does support different meshes. Most of your non-moving objects could be considered for static batching as long as they have a mesh filter and a mesh and a mesh renderer, and they meet several other conditions that are laid out in the documentation, and all you really have to do is mark them as static. GPU instancing, on the other hand, is used when you want to move objects around in your scene, but they all share the same mesh. We're going to write some code to demonstrate how you would do that. We're going to need a mesh that we want to instance, and we could get that from a game object, or maybe we could pass in a mesh. We're also going to need a material to use on them. For GPU instancing, the optimization will render multiple copies of the same mesh with the same material in a single draw call. We'll lay them out in a grid and have some spacing between them. And I'm going to use a sine wave to move them around. So let's have a wave speed, height, and frequency. The primary way to use GPU instancing is through the graphics.rendermesh instance method, which takes render params. You also need to keep information about all of your matrix 4x4 data, which you can keep just as a list of matrix 4x4 data, or you can have a list of structs that has even more information, including a rendering layer mask and anything else you want to know. For example, I want to know the distance from the center of the grid to any given object. I'll add a variable here so that we can reference any one of those as we're processing them. But we do want to keep them all in a collection, so let's have a list here for all of the instances that we're going to create. Uh, let's also have two floats here so that we know the exact center of our grid. I'll just quickly wrap these up in a region and then collapse them down. Now we can create a start method to do a little bit of setup. First of all, let's see if I provided a prefab to this component. And if we did, let's just take the mesh right from there. If I didn't do that, then maybe we could just make a primitive. Let's make a primitive sphere. We'll take the mesh from there and we can destroy the primitive because we don't need it. Now for the material that we're going to use, we want to make sure that we've enabled instancing. You can do this on a checkbox on the material, or you can do it right here in code. With the material, we can instance our render params. Now render params can have more than just material. You could set the shadow casting mode. You could set receive shadows. And there's about 20 others that you can dig into in the documentation to make things more performant. 
Now, finally, based on the grid size, we can determine the center of the grid for x and z. Then we can iterate over all of the x and z positions and set up our initial data. We'll calculate a position for each one, and then we'll just add a new instance data into our list. For that, we can set our matrix using TRS, which stands for Transform, Rotate, and Scale. Set our rendering layer mask to one unsigned int, and we'll calculate the distance from the center as well now so we don't have to do it later. And that's all our setup. Let's collapse this up and actually do some GPU instancing. In our update method, let's start by calculating a time based on time.time .time multiplied by our wave speed. Then we'll iterate over all of our instances. For each one, we'll grab the reference and we'll calculate what its y offset should be based on mathf.sign, where we multiply time minus the distance multiplied by frequency and all of that multiplied by the wave height. Now recall that a matrix 4x4 takes this kind of structure, so we don't need to create a new vector 3 position. We could just access the M13 position of the matrix and update the Y offset that way, update our instance inside of the collection, and we're good. Then the last and most important part of the puzzle, we have to call render mesh instanced. We pass in the render params, the mesh, the index of the sub mesh. Now I don't have any sub meshes, so we're just going to use zero and we'll pass in all of our instances. So here is where you would pass in the list of structs, or if you were just using a list of matrix four by four, you could pass that instead. So let's jump back into Unity and try this out. If we quickly take a look at this white material and scroll right down to the bottom into advanced options, you can see the tick box for enable GPU instancing. We set ours in code, but you can do it this way as well. If we take a look at my example script here where I've added our new component, I'm just gonna adjust the grid size down to something reasonable and we'll press play. And here's our simulation. So 40 by 40 is 1600 game objects moving around. You'll have to ignore my FPS because I'm recording, so it's meaningless, but it's rendering really smoothly. If we open up our frame debugger again and we click enable, we're going to see something interesting now. These items aren't included in our SRP batcher, which only has one batch right now, which is the plane. So there's only one draw call. But right underneath that, you can see render loop dot draw. We see these new entries for draw mesh instanced. In the details, you can see that the mesh was a sphere and you can see the reason it's not included in the SRP batcher is because this node is not compatible with the batcher. And that's just the case with GPU instancing. Instead of seeing any draw calls here, we see draw instanced calls and there's only one. So all of these calls were batched together and the optimizer decided that it could fit 400 and some objects in each draw. The highest number of instances you can have in one of these batches is 1023. So there are some optimization techniques you can use to get this number higher than 454. Of course, this last batch here is whatever was left over and couldn't fit into one of the previous ones. So I'm going to make the grid a little bit bigger and we'll see how that looks. And while we're doing that, I'll just mention there's a few gotchas. Meshes that have a low vertex count aren't really optimal for GPU instancing. But what it is really good for is showing a lot of the same objects that share the same mesh. So things like grass, trees, or even these spheres that have a high vertex count. This is perfect because we don't have to store a copy of the same mesh for every single instance. And not just that, but we can move them around. So let's quickly compare and contrast static batching to GPU instancing. Static batching works for objects that aren't going to move around, and it reduces your draw calls but increases the amount of memory being consumed. The big pro here is that you can combine different meshes together as long as they use the same material. GPU instancing does not work for static objects. It works for objects that might have to move, and it reduces draw calls and saves you memory, but it doesn't support multiple meshes. You only use that when they're all using the same mesh. In both cases, changing the material is going to break your batching. You can work around that with material property blocks or texture atlases or both. There are quite a few other techniques you can use to optimize as well, including LODs and LOD groups, imposters, culling, and many other things that we'll get into in future videos. But for now, that's all I've got for you today. Don't forget to join us on Discord. Hit subscribe if you're interested in more content like this every week. I'll throw another video up on the screen. Maybe I'll see you there.